much to thank him for. And I've got so much to thank him for. So much, so much to praise him for. You see, you see, he has been so good to me. And when I think, I think of what he's done and where, and where he has brought me from. So much to thank him for. Make sure it's on. Give me one more song, please, Brady.
How many preachers we have? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to make you stand up and acknowledge you. There's the hands up there. Okay. All right. Good, good. Dan, come on up here for a minute. Dan Davis is from, uh, you know, what is that called? The, the, oh, yeah, Canada. And we love them. We go back a ways here, the Six Nations over there. And what I want you guys to do is come up here and lay hands on him and pray with him. He's going to a church now, an uh, older fellow that was there, and they're, they're down to, like, uh, his family and him in Canada, uh, over there in Brantford. And uh, he wants God's will, and he wants God's blessing, and uh, he just he's got called to preach. And uh, so I'm just, if, if we get up here with him, I'm going to have him nailed down at the altar. We just put hands on him. And uh, ask that God would bless him and, and encourage that work there, because we need King James churches in Canada. Amen. Lord, 
we lay on people's hearts. I pray, God, you give him the people of God that you want him to have. I know so many times, if we're not careful, we get people that it ends up for a problem instead of being a blessing. And I just pray, God, just send him the people, God, that you want. May, Lord, uh, those Canadians uh, yeah. be saved. God, yeah. I pray. Lord, you'd send revival, God, to yeah. their country. Yeah. I ask you, Lord, to bless this man as he goes. His family, there'll be times of discouragement. There'll be times of hardship. But, God, you call him. Yeah. And, Lord, uh, with the calling, you also make a way for it to happen. Yeah. So, God, I pray you'd bless them all in Jesus' name. through those trials and troubles, that you give him the grace, you give him the guts, Lord, to go through yeah, and do yeah. what he needs to do. Bless him, Lord, and touch him, God. Thank you for allowing us to serve you. And God bless my brother. In Jesus' yeah. name, amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah, Canada's a, whew. you can't even joke at the border anymore. It's bad. Don't take no queer tracks over here. Wow. Whew. Man, we're getting like that here. You mentioned hell, and there's gonna, somebody's going to have a traumatic experience. They're going to be doing that, just so just prepare yourself. Lawyers will be getting their funds, and they'll be looking for people to try to sue Tie it up in court. Yep, they're using our system to get us. So, and keep your powder dry, too, please. If you're a Christian, don't forget that. Yes. I'm not going to be a martyr in America unless God wants me to be one in America. Amen. So, glory. Tony, you got a message? Stupid question. Okay, Tony. See, it's got this black thing on it. I had to be careful. I got to be a careful night talking about black. But there it is, don't it? <laughs> oh, I just lost it. Oh, look at that sun. <laughs> Found a little afro. Yeah, yeah. It looks like that, doesn't it? Somebody get some super glue or something. Technology, you gotta love it. Yeah. I love it. I'm a gadget kind of guy. I preach from an iPad now, just my notes, not my Bible. Yeah, yeah one of them. Whoa. The abomination. The abomination that maketh desolate is in this yeah. pulpit. But uh, no, we uh, don't want to replace the Bible, that's for sure. Amen. And. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, let's go there, I reckon. Revelation chapter 4. This is uh, s some thoughts that's been on my heart these last few months. And um, I thank God that he's allowed me to pastor up north. And, um, and it's a, uh, I, I told the preacher <laughs> not too long after I went, got up there, I, and I sent him a text or email or I don't know if it was over might have been over the phone and I said I am so sorry for not being a better assistant pastor <laughs> I am, yeah. but um, he God's gracious and uh, and uh, maybe he's, he's uh, why well, not not maybe I know he's 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 teaching us and uh, we'll be as pastors taught us over the years you'll You'll be in school until the day he calls you out, 
and uh, I just want to learn what he's got for us. I want to I want to graduate with honors. Amen. I don't want to go out in disgrace. And um, so you pray for us up there. We are having a meeting next week. Um, you know, thank the preacher for uh, hosting it and announcing it. Uh, you're all welcome to come. I know it's uh, it'd be uh, tough to come up after this meeting, but uh, uh, you're welcome, and we'll have a good time. And uh, I sure miss Brother Henson, as I mentioned yeah. before, and. Uh, He's just a hero, and we miss him, but uh, uh, you pray for him, too. He's not, he's, uh, doesn't sound like he's going to get on the road till the end of May, maybe, but uh, it sounds like the Lord is uh, uh, helping him with his leg, and um, so just pray, pray for, pray for one another. We need it. Uh, in Canada, we just pray for the brother in Canada. Uh, uh, we, we joke, and, uh, but it's serious business. Uh, this thing that we're in, it is serious. Uh, we we have an enemy. We've heard it this week. We've got enemies, uh, spiritual enemies, and domestic enemies. <laughs> Amen. Uh, th- this world is not our friend. Uh, and 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 when it comes down to it, as much as we in- we we appreciate it, listen, conservatives aren't going to be our friend. That's right. Our only friend is the Lord. And one another. And uh, thank God if there's some folks in politics that are saved and, and we can rejoice in that. And I thank God for that. I really do. But, uh, but we don't look to them uh, to get us, uh, you know, bring revival to the country. The only one that's going to bring revival, uh, and whether you're on the side that says we might be able to get it or you're on the side that says, well, it'll never come. Uh, if it does come, it'll only be by the Holy Spirit of God. And um, I know that uh, what he's pleased with, and that's what I want to preach on this morning, Amen. on what pleases God. In Revelation chapter 4, the scene uh, in heaven, we've kind of we've kind of got a little glimpse of this scene this week. Yeah. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but uh, Tuesday night, I, I, I was in another world. Yeah. Amen. I was, I was in the, for a little space of time there, we, we, was, we, was, we was in this scene right here. I believe, and uh, you say, well, that's kind of spooky. Well, it was spooky, amen. <laughs> you get in the presence of the Lord, you'll get kind of spooked, amen. amen. Verse, uh, verse, verse 10 says, the uh, four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure... They are and were created. Uh, the Bible declares that God has created all things for his pleasure, not ours. Although we get to enjoy it, uh, we got to be careful sometimes. We know we get to, uh, on, on the negative side so much that uh, we, we, you know, we, we, and we ought to. We ought to put ourselves in check. We ought to remember who we are in the flesh. And, uh, and, and remember this thought that we're preaching this morning that, that we're created for God's pleasure uh, but but thank God he lets us get in on his pleasure, yeah, amen? Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not a drudgery to serve the Lord. Uh, when we say that, that, uh, that he didn't create everything for our pleasure, that doesn't mean that we, can, we, don't, we need to walk around with a sad face and gloomy yeah. and, and despondent. If we're saved, you ought to be the happiest person in the world. Amen. amen. You ought to, and and everything, every, every circumstance isn't happy. Every, every ounce of our life is not a happy time, but we ought, you ought, we ought to be the happiest pers- uh, per- people in the world going through trials and tribulations, yeah. even. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yeah. Amen. We don't have strength going through things because we don't have the joy of the Lord. Right. We sing songs like we sang this morning, and, 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 and I'm guilty. We get in the church, and we get in the routine, and, and, and we sing these songs, and we forget what we're singing about. And we're there just to have church, and we gotta we gotta remember we gotta have the joy of the Lord. But uh, but he but the bottom line, this verse declares these these uh, four and twenty elders declared that everything was created for His pleasure. And mankind thinks this world revolves around them. Uh, you you look at the news, and you look at uh, uh, education. Uh, everybody thinks that everything's supposed to revolve around man. That we are to just, you know, we're to, we're to live for self, make things better for ourselves. Yeah. And uh, that's why people look for churches <laughs> that make them feel comfortable. Yeah. 
you know, that's why, you, you know, you, 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 you get folks get, get miffed with uh, something that goes on in the church, and, and they don't look for somewhere they can get in to, to be a help. They look for somewhere they can get in so they can feel comfortable. And uh, people don't do anything that brings glory to God anymore. And I'm I speaking in general, generalities, I understand that. But they're because they're worried about themselves. We mentioned that last night. You know why folks don't, don't go to church faithfully and don't congregate with one another faithfully? Because they're ate up with themselves. Right. If we were to consider one another, we'd provoke one another to love and good works. Right. Yeah. The Bible says, let each esteem the other better themselves. Preacher mentioned it last night. Uh, when, you go, when you get into... into uh, this world's uh, philosophy, they're, they're trying to push uh, each other's and build each other's self-esteem. Uh, and, and it's got into the churches. Uh, I've seen whole curriculums for, for Sunday school built around building one another's self-esteem. Listen, it, we're, it, this thing is not uh, helping you to feel good about yourself. Amen. The, uh, this book is, is written, God give us this book as a mirror that, that reflects who we are. And, and there's both sides of the coin. It, it tells you uh, who we are in the flesh. It lets us know that we're sinners. But on the other hand, it also lets us know who we are in Christ. Thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. But, but if you don't get the first part down, you're not going to enjoy the second part. We like to focus on the, the positive. But if you don't get the negative side aspect of Christianity down, you're never going to enjoy the positive. Yeah. And uh, that's the philosophy of this world. If you love God, you'll bring glory to him. If you love God, you'll bring glory to him. Uh, Brother uh, Mark talks about it often in his messages, uh, about the, that uh, message that, uh, or was it, yeah, it was a message, all right. It wasn't a, it wasn't a sermon, but it was a message that uh, Brother Maddox preached with one verse. <laughs> if any man love God, the same is known of him. Why? Because he's bringing glory to God. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink, Amen. We ate this morning. Yeah. Whatever you do, I'm glad he threw that in there that we can glorify him in eating. I like to eat. Amen. <laughs> you can thank God for your food. Amen. Amen. Bow your head at the table in the restaurant and thank God for it. You can glorify God in whatever you do, whether eat or drink, whatsoever you do. Do all to the glory of God. He didn't say, uh, you know, we had to become monks and go live in a mountain somewhere and go and, and, and separate ourselves to the uh, point that, uh, that we don't get around folks. You can enjoy life. You can do things in this life. You can go on vacation. Yeah. Amen. You can have fun. But whatever you're doing, make sure you're glorifying God. Yeah. That'll help you. That'll help you with your, with your attitude. That'll help you with your dress. That'll help you with everything. We don't have to preach on. We don't have to give a list on what you can wear, what you can't wear, how you need to cut your hair. You want to glorify God, it'll all happen. Amen. You'll, you'll, you'll do what you need to do to glorify him. When you get dressed, you'll be thinking, well, Lord, is this pleasing to you? When you go to get a haircut, you say, Lord, you know, should I shave half my head and leave the other half long? Will that bring glory to you? I don't know. Maybe it will. No, no, I doubt it. No, it won't. I doubt it. Very much. Very much so. And I'm afraid we preachers sometimes cater to this idea. And I say we. Again, generality speaking, I'm not talking about necessarily our crowd. And we <laughs> definitely hear plenty negative. Amen. But we cater to this idea that the world revolves around us. And you hear these uh, these these. Uh, TV evangelists and the health and wealth gospel preachers that, that spew this, this idea that God wants you to have a good day today. Amen. God may not want you to have a good day. God may want you to have a bad day today. He may, he may bring something in your life that's very bad so that you can be a blessing to somebody else, so that you can learn a lesson maybe, so that you can go through something that'll, that'll build your character. He doesn't always want us to have an enjoyable day. Because everything was created for his pleasure. And he gets pleasure out of some strange things, let me tell you. The, we, if you ever stumble across Joel Osteen on television, and if you, wanna, if you, need, to, if you need to go on a diet, or you, what do they call that when folks eat and they regurgitate their food? You know, if you need to do that, I, you, can, you can turn him on, and, you'll, and if you're a Bible believer, you'll puke. Within no short time, amen? Uh, but one of his famous quotes to his congregation is this. God wants us to prosper financially. And they'll use verses. <laughs> they'll use verses in your Bible. Misapplied. 
Listen, I understand God is, you can't outgive God. I know all the, uh, all the cliches, and, and, and it's true. You can't outgive him. But just because you give does not mean he is going to financially bless you. Amen. You can look around. And you can, uh, you can think of it, somebody in your life, a, a, a preacher or, or a family or a missionary that has given everything to God, and they have nothing. Paul got to the end of his life, and he said, I have lost all things. Yeah. So God may not want you to fi prosper financially, but he still wants you to give. He says that God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money. Man, we are out of the will of God, Amen. According to Joel Osteen, many of, most of us, most of Christianity is out of the will of God. Because he's thinking of uh, Americans. He's got America in mind. He's not thinking of those folks over in China or those folks over in Afghanistan uh, that are serving God and giving their life for him. They have nothing. And they've given everything. But he, wants to, he says God wants us to prosper financially, to have plenty of money, to fulfill the destiny he has laid out for us. Uh, God's destiny is not... Uh, to for us to, uh, to to live on the high hog, and if He allows that, praise God. I know I know there are Christians that have that do give, and God blesses them financially, and it's possible. But it's not the it's not the rule. Don't think because you might be struggling financially that you're not in the will of God. Amen. You you you, you got Bible. You've got this this book that tells us. That we were created for his pleasure and whatever he brings in our life to bring him pleasure. If we would just submit to it, if we would just recognize it and say, Lord, whatever you have, we would be able to enjoy his pleasure. But many times we're looking for our pleasure. Now, the last I checked, the world revolves around the sun. Amen. <laughs> Regardless of what some people think. <laughs> I guess there's a... I, you know, there's some strange stuff going around, but yeah, uh, yeah, the earth is flat and, uh, the, and yeah, but uh, last we checked, the world revolves around the sun until, until uh, the Bible or science proves otherwise, amen. Uh, Christian's life should, we also should revolve around Jesus Christ, that our life should be revolving around him, and uh, that, that goes for our family, that goes for our career. Whatever God has for you, it ought to revolve around him. Uh, our, you know, we, we have to pay the bills. <laughs> Amen? Uh, you have to work. If you, the Bible is clear. If you don't work, you don't eat. You have to work. And then we understand that. And, and, uh, and, but, but everything that we do ought to have him in the center. Whether it's our job, whether it's our family, uh, the, 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 the mantra <laughs> You know, we don't go to church on Sunday because it's the only day we have to spend for our family. How many times have you heard that? Especially you pastors. You know, you've heard that over and over again. I'm just starting to hear it. But the reason we don't go to church is because, uh, you know, it's the only day we have to spend with our families. Well, spend it with the, in the house of God. That's the best place. Get your family around God or else you won't have, might not have a family very long. You want to keep your family, get, keep them with the Lord. Amen. Keep your, your, your family uh, revolving around the sun. In our ministries, sometimes our ministries begin to revolve around us. Sometimes our ministries begin to, uh, you know, begin to be centered and focused on, on us. You know, and our enemies and our uh, the people that, that don't like us and, and, you know, God help us. You know, there's somebody that's, that, 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 that's against me. <laughs> Join the crowd, amen? Jesus Christ had all kinds of folks against him. Went belly aching and, and just go on and serve God, Amen? We get the idea that God doesn't ever want us to have pain or do without. Mm, I don't like pain. I really don't. Uh, I think Brother Harry Nix, amen, one of my heroes in the ministry, said, no pain, no pain. <laughs> That's his philosophy, amen. <laughs> but God may allow us to go through pain. We think of Brother Edmonds this morning. I mean, this, that was a preemptive surgery. That was a pre-plan to do something, to, to, to try to prevent something. Yeah. And God knew exactly what he was going into, and he allowed this thing to happen to him. You say, oh, you mean God did? I didn't say God did it to him, but he allowed it to happen. Yeah. He knows all things. Yeah. And, and, and maybe he did that so we would pray. Amen. Maybe he did that just so, so that, that Christians around the world would see, see where our burden's at for our brother in Christ. 
But, but whatever the reason, we don't know, always know the reason. But we know that whatever he does, whatever he's created, and you're, if you're saved, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. He's created all things for his pleasure. If we could just get that in our crawl, if we could get that, keep that in the forefront of our mind, we might enjoy our Christianity a little more. Amen. Proverbs 21, 17, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. You know why? You will go into debt. That's what we do. I'm, I'm guilty. We love pleasure more than we love God, and that's why we go into debt. I'm not talking about good debt, getting a house. I'm not talking about those things, but you know what I'm talking about. Or they're giving all their money to Joe Osteen, what? You know, that's why folks, that's why people, you know, we, the preacher mentioned it this week about beer and, and drugs, and uh, that's why people do those things. Why? Because they love pleasure more than they love God. There's only, the, the only reason that you would ever uh, suck down a beer or suck on a cigarette or suck on a, on a joint is because you love pleasure more than you love God. And there's Christians all over the world that are partaking of these things. They're supposed to be born again. I believe some, many of them are. At least some of them might not be. But I believe many of them are. And, and somewhere along the line, they began to love pleasure like Demas. Yeah. You know what, what Demas had? He had a love problem. He loved this present world. That's why he departed. That's why he left the preacher. Yeah. Because he loved pleasure more than he loved God. Yeah. You begin to love pleasure more than you love God, you won't be around very long. Amen. 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 I know that I know there's some things that God doesn't have pleasure in. The Bible declares in, uh, in Psalm 5, verse 4, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Brother Drummond preached on this last night. Wickedness. Yeah. God hates sin. Yeah. He hates it. He doesn't have pleasure in it. Uh, you, we we, we want to we wanna please God. And this whole thing about pleasing God, you're not gonna, you can't please God by, by you doing anything. But I guarantee you, you're not going to please him by allowing wickedness in your life. Right. He's not pleased with wickedness. He's not pleased with religion either. Yeah. He hates sin. But he hates religion. He hates that false worship, that, that, that outward worship that's only outward. God hates religion. He told us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. And so just because you might dress up on the outside and wear a tie and wear a dress and, and make sure you look the part, doesn't mean he has pleasure in what you're doing either. He hates religion. Yeah, I mean, if you're not loving him and, and everything that, that comes out of the outside is not a result of you falling in love with Jesus Christ, he's, he wants to spit you out of his mouth. Amen. He said, I'd, worth, I'd rather you be cold. He'd almost rather us be on the opposite end of the extreme than right in the middle with a you know, lukewarm heart. And we got all the things right on the outside, but inside we're full of dead men's bones. Yeah. He hates religion. But the verse says, all things were created for his pleasure. And so obviously, he's created us to bring him pleasure. What pleases God? Yeah. You want to know what pleases God? Here's some things that please God. Number one, the sacredness of his son. Yes, sir. And turn to Colossians chapter 1, if you will. Colossians chapter 1. I tell you, this has helped me to realize that no matter no, the amount of works that I do, and, we, and we've heard it preached, and it's in the Bible. He wants us to do good works. Uh, it's, it's sad that preachers got to qualify everything they say anymore these days because there's so many uh, critics out there that, that, you know, always looking for something to, uh, when, we, when you preach, you, you can't, when we try sometimes, we want to preach the whole counsel of God in every message because you got to run the gamut so you don't offend somebody. <laughs> <coughs> But when we, when, we, when we preach about this point of what pleases God and, we, and what we're going to get into this morning, uh, does not, we're, not, we're not saying that uh, you know, you're not to do anything for God. You're not to be a servant. Uh, he's created us as sons, yes. He's made us accepted and beloved sons of God. But Paul, no matter, no matter what you read in the Bible, Paul, everywhere Paul said, I'm a servant. Yeah. But sometimes we get the wrong impression that we please God. By doing. 
that everything we, when we do pleases him. And that is not what pleases God. He could care less what you do. He wants you to get in something. He wants you to be in, in, in him and let what he puts in you come out. Then he'll be pleased. There, see, the Pharisees did all kinds of things. The Pharisees, they, had, they, they, they dressed right. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they went to the, the temple. Uh, every time the doors were open, they did all the things that they thought pleased God. And it was all on the outside. And, and they were the worst problem that Jesus Christ had on this earth. He's not pleased with what you do. He's not pleased just because you got up this morning, got dressed, and came to, came to camp meeting. Now, hear me out. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Colossians chapter 1. This is what God's pleased with. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Who is the image, speaking of Christ, the in, uh, of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. We, you know, we, 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 we think about this, you know, well, God just created everything for, for me. The birds, everything he's created for, for, so we can enjoy it. No, that's not what it says. It says they were created for his pleasure. Again, thank God we get to enjoy it. But they weren't created for our pleasure. They're created for his, for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Look at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. You know what pleases God? The sacredness of his son. He didn't begin in Bethlehem. Uh, the, 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 the cults, you know, use some of these verses to try to say, well, see, Jesus Christ had a beginning. Uh, and, and they use other verses in the scriptures that, uh, that he was the first begotten. The only, uh, you know, he, that, that therefore he had a beginning. No, he didn't have a beginning, but he began everything. <laughs> everything that exists was created by him. The Bible says that uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw him in, in, in there in the furnace. He didn't begin in Bethlehem, and he existed long before Bethlehem. Yeah. John 8, verse 58, Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. He didn't begin in Bethlehem. Uh, God didn't be, uh, give him a beginning, but he began all things. It pleased God to, to begin all things with him. The idea that Jesus is a created being is anti-scriptural. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus Christ said, I and my Father are one. And we know the famous verse in 1 John 5, 7 that talks about the Trinity. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And we rejoice in that, that, that aspect of the Trinity, and, uh, Trinity but, but it pleased God. This verse says that it pleased God, the Godhead, that in one member of the Trinity that all the fullness should dwell. That's an amazing thought. That, that the, the Godhead decided that, that the one, ask, one member of the Trinity, that everything was going to dwell in him and that he was going to create all things by him. You know, we, the Charismatics, one of the things that we get down on the Charismatics for is why they put too much of an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's God. You can't, you can't discount the Holy Spirit. When we, when we preach about this doctrine, when we, when we teach folks about tongues and teach folks about uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we don't discount the Holy Spirit. It's God. It's just as much God as Jesus Christ the Son is. But it pleased Him that in the Son should all fullness dwell. You know what pleases God? The sacredness of His Son. You know, when President Trump took office, he took everything that he had of his business and put it in his son. He gave them the power to run his business. You know, that's what God did. God the Father said, everything's going under the son. And he's put, the Bible says that he, he pleased the Father, that in him should all the fullness dwell. And Jesus came and spake unto them, verse, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. 
All power, everything, every bit of power that God has, he gave it to Jesus Christ. It pleased God to begin all things with him. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Look at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be, to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and cometh thou to me. I mean, could you imagine John standing there in the river and seeing his cousin come walking down the, down the road and realizing that he's the Messiah, he is God in the flesh, and he's coming to get baptized of you? Could you imagine if, if the Lord showed up in your church, preachers, and said, I need you to baptize me? Oh, man, we'd be, we'd be falling all over ourselves. And John, is the same way, he said, what, what's going on? Verse 15, and Jesus answering, said unto him, suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. You know why it's good to get baptized? Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness by getting baptized. So you better get baptized. Amen. Don't, don't let any of these, these people fool you into thinking that just because Paul said Christ sent me not to baptize means we shouldn't be baptized. Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness by getting baptized. Then he suffered him. In verse 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lining upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We, we live our life, I, want to, I just want to please God. I want to do everything I can to please God. Well, you want to please God, the first thing you need to do is get into Christ. You can't please him. This world is, there's, there are people that are not in Christ, that are sincerely trying to please God. They're not saved. They've never trusted his, uh, his redemptive work on the cross. And, but they, they are good people. They're doing good things. Why? Because they're trying to please God. And if you're here this morning, and most likely, everybody, if you're here at a camp meeting on a Thursday morning, you're probably saved. But if you're trying to please God by you, you're not going to do it. We get up every morning and, 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 and we, we don't, we don't uh, avail ourselves of the Holy Spirit of God and His power. We don't avail ourselves of, the, of, of the, the presence of Jesus Christ in our life. And we go about our day in the flesh. We go about our day doing everything we do in our own strength. We don't pray and ask Him for strength. We don't have the joy of the Lord. And if you don't have the joy of the Lord, you don't have His strength. So if you're doing anything for God without those things, you're doing it in your own strength. And that's why people get weary in well-doing. That's why people get out of church and they quit the ministry. They quit serving God. They quit church because they're wore out in the flesh. And we, we have the, the, the thing that pleases God the most living inside of us. See, when he, when he come up out of that water, I mean, God looked down on a life that had, that had lived 30 years by that time to do nothing but please him. He looked down on a life that had spent his whole life doing nothing but pleasing him. And he looked, he said, I like what I see. I like what I see. That's, that's what I'm pleased with. You want to please the Father? Look to Jesus Christ. Amen? Surrender to him. We're not saying, you know, sit on your laurels and do nothing, but get in his yoke as we preached last night. We, the reason why we're, 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 we're frustrated with our Christianity and our failures, and we're going to fail, we're human beings. And when we do it in our own strength, we do fail. When we're doing it in his strength, we won't fail. It's a guarantee. If he's working through you, if he's doing anything in your life, you're not going to fail at what he's got for you. But when we fail, it's because we fail to get in his yoke. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, and if you want to please the Father, you'll get in the yoke with Christ and let him do all the pleasing, and you just follow along. You follow along, you let him do the work, you let him be pleasing to the Father and realize that there's nothing in us that can please him, nothing. The, the Pharisees, they had all, the, they had all the, the good works on the outside, and they didn't please God. Made, they made him sick. They made him sick. It pleased God to put all things in his son, and it pleased God not only to begin with him, but it pleased him to behold him. God, through history, looked down at a humanity that he created, 
He created man for his pleasure. Created Adam and Eve for his pleasure. That's what the Bible says. And, and not too long after he created them, they blew it. Why? Because they got to looking at what they could get out of it. And he looked down, and time after time, dispensation after dispensation, he, God looked down and seen a humanity that was living for themselves, that had no, no desire to please him, till one day his son became born of a virgin. And he lived his life, and he looked down, and he said, that pleases me. Now I'm pleased. Now we can finish this thing. I mean, that before man tried to please God, do all those things that please God, and God said, no, that ain't going to work, ain't working. I mean, you go along for a little while, you do good, but then you just, you just fumble right over your feet. But Jesus Christ came and walked this earth. He was tempted in all points. Everything that you can think of. The Bible says all points. There's nothing that, that, that you go through that he didn't go through. I know you can't fathom that, and, and I, ladies, I don't understand that, but it's true. It's what the Bible says. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And he pleased the Father. What pleases God? You want to please God? Get in Christ. Amen. Uh, be robed in him. Uh, when you get up every morning, say, Lord, Lord, I can't, you know I can't do this in my flesh. You know there's nothing good in me. I need the power of Jesus Christ. He was given all power into his hands, and, he's, and, and, and by him putting him inside you, you have the power to live a Christian life. You want to live a Christian life? You want to live a life that pleases God? You have it inside you. The Son. The Son pleases him. He's pleased to behold him. The Bible says in Genesis 6, verse 5, that God looked down and saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Psalm 53 and verse 2 says, God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand that any that did seek God. And it says, every one of them has gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. There, there, there's nobody that's ever been able to please God except for Jesus Christ. Now, there's been folks that, that you know, God looked down, he called him his friend, he called Abraham his friend. Amen. Moses, I mean, he, he was God's right-hand man. David, man after God's own heart. But none of them could please God. Only Jesus Christ pleased God. You want to please God? Get in him. It pleased God not only to behold him, but turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He, he, he was born, the Bible says he's like a, a root out of dry ground. He was a miraculous birth. And God gave him a body. God gave uh, Put, planted that seed in Mary, and that little child began to form, and God looked down. You're talking about ultrasound. <laughs> Amen. God, he, you know, he's better than Superman. He looked down through that womb, and he saw that little, that, that little fetus, you know, that they call. It's not a, that, that they don't think it's a human being, but Jesus Christ was one of those at one point. Amen. He, he is in that womb, and he began to grow, began to form limbs and, and eyes and, and, and a heart, and he began to form that body that the Lord had created, prepared for him. He said, a body thou hast prepared me, and that body that he prepared for him began to grow. God watched that thing grow, and then it was born. And, and you, you parents know, I mean, uh, when those kids come out, it doesn't matter how gross it looks, no matter how, how ugly they are when they're born, you, when they come out, you, you think it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. That's your kid. Amen. And God, don't, don't tell me that God didn't put that desire, that, that, that joy in our hearts. Because when he saw his son born, when he saw that baby come out of that womb, boy, he was pleased. He was pleased with his son. And he saw that little boy grow up, and we watch our kids grow up, and we, we watch them do things, and we get joy out of it, amen. And we enjoy seeing them grow up and, and learn how to play sports or learn how to, you know, uh, sh kill animals or whatever, you know, whatever you have them do. Or you learn how to cook and clean, amen. That's, that, pray, praise God for ladies that teach their kids how to, their daughters how to clean, cook. Hallelujah. <clears throat> But he watched that baby grow up in a, as a toddler and learn to walk. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus Christ having to learn to walk? 
God having to learn how to walk. You want to learn how to walk? We need to learn how to walk. Amen. We, we, we get people saved and we throw them right into a ministry somewhere and we, and we expect them to, to survive. And they haven't even learned how to walk yet. But Jesus Christ, God looked down and watched him begin to learn how to walk and take his first steps. And, and just like we get proud, well, he's going to take, take his first step. God's up there. There he is. He's taking that first step on this earth. He watched that baby grow up, become a, a young teenager. And he watched every aspect of his life. And every time he looked down and saw, he said, boy, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with my son. And then he watched him go into the ministry, begin to preach. And he was pleased with everything he said. And Isaiah prophesied about this 1,700 and some odd years before Jesus Christ was born. And it says in verse 3, he is despised and rejected of men. He saw his son that he was so proud of. Uh, if you can use that, that, that phrase in, 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 a, in a spiritual context, being proud, I know it's pride to sin, but you know what I mean. He saw that son that he was so pleased with be rejected of his creation. He is despised and rejected. That, that, that beautiful body that he prepared him, that, 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 that perfect specimen of a human being, he watched mankind reject him and spit in his face. And he was pleased with his son. Could you, you know how you get when somebody messes with your kids? Even if they're, even if they're on the wrong, you get upset. Why? Because they're your kid. Even if they've done wrong, you kind of, you know, you want to smack them in the head, but, but you defend them to a fault sometimes. Why? Because they're your kid. But Jesus Christ didn't do anything wrong. And they rejected him. And they spit him in his face, and they ripped his beard out, and they, and they crucified him, and they beat him. And God watched that take place. says he's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. God, he didn't know what it meant to, to go through life as a human being until his son. But his son not only had to endure the, uh, enjoy the, the good times, he endured the sorrows. He, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. How in the world could you, could you be concerned about your self-esteem? Why would we be concerned about, about being, feeling good about ourselves when Jesus Christ was not esteemed by humanity? We get full of ourselves. You know why we don't please God? It's because we're full of self. Verse 4. So surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, not his. He was bruised for our iniquities, not his. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. But look at verse 10. This is what I'm talking about. Some of the strangest things, strangest things in the world please God. Verse 10 breaks my heart. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Christians, sometimes you go through life and you get bruises. 
and you think, oh, man, I must be out of the will of God. I must be doing something wrong. And maybe you are. I don't know. Maybe that's why you got a bruise. But maybe, just maybe, as God was pleased by bruising his son, you might have to go through something in this life and get some knocks and get some bruises to please your father. If it pleased the father to bruise him, we sing that song and, and, and for a while I didn't understand what the writer was thinking. That song that my family sang the other night, Have You Died? And, if, and, the, and there's a line in that song that says that you know, if, if Jesus Christ had to go through all those things and, and die on a cross, then, then what makes us think that we're exempt from that? I'm not talking about we're not dying for one another's sins. But Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. He, sa he says, I die daily. And we go through life and we, and we want to escape this life without any, with as fewest uh, bruises, with the fewest uh, uh, marks as possible. And Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes we might sit back and look at the bruises that's happening to us. And sometimes the devil, God will use the devil. He told his disciples, it must needs be that offenses come. But woe unto him by whom they come, but it still had to come. The Bible says that, that Paul, uh, or, or Peter and, and, and the disciples said that those Jews murdered and killed, crucified their Messiah. We know that he gave up his life, but they still did it. God will use people. He might even use the brethren to bruise you. But you know what? He'll be pleased with it. We often pray and, and ask God, to, Lord, not, don't let us go through that. Lord, help us to escape. I, I, you know, Lord, Lord uh, please take away the, the, the reproach. Please. And, and he, all along, he's wanting to get pleasure out of our life by bruising us. The blueness of a wound talks about in, uh, over there in the book of Proverbs. You know what that does when you discipline your children? Yeah, you're not, you're not glorying in the fact that they're uh, having pain. Sometimes we do, I guess. But in, seriousness, ser in all seriousness, you're doing it to better that child so they can understand, so they don't do it again. And God will sometimes beat the far out of you and bruise you because he is pleased by bruising his son. And if you're a son of God, you might have to endure some chastening. You might have to endure some affliction, just like Jesus Christ did. It pleased the father to bruise him. He's pleased with the sacredness of his son. Now, I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to preach the rest of this message, but I hope this morning that we have a desire to please God. But don't get the wrong idea of what pleases him. You know, you'll be satisfied with your service for the Lord when you quit serving him in your own strength. You know how we know we're not Serving the Lord through the Son is when we begin to look at everybody else's service and say, well, well, how come they're not doing it like I'm doing? How come they don't preach like I preach? How come they don't pass out tracts like I pass out tracts? Now, they may not do it because they don't love the Lord. I don't know. But when you're serving the Lord and you're in his yoke, you could care less what anybody else is doing. You can enjoy your Christianity. You can enjoy your service for him because he's pleased with his son. You know, the Bible talks about young guys having all the strength. You know, with all that strength and that young motivation, there's a lot of pride. And sometimes, a, as a young man, you think the old guys don't know what's going on or they're too old. And, and God will take you aside a lot of times and beat you down to size. 
and that's good for you. It's not bad for you. Sometimes the pastor will put you in check and you're thinking you're gung-ho and you want to get out the horse race and just get out of the gate and just do it. And sometimes pastors will just say, nope. Sometimes the young bucks will go out and do it anyway because, I mean, after all, they're serving God. I don't want nobody to slow them down. God will slow you down. A whole lot better sometimes to have obedience than to learn it the hard way. But as Tony was preaching, all of us are affected by what he preached about, all of us. If we really concentrated on how much time a day we really served him in his pleasure, we fall short, real short, all of us, because we're busy people. Sometimes we're busy, don't even need to be busy, but we're just gonna stay busy, do something. And I've even been known to just, all of a sudden, in order to preach on someone or something, just go out one, you know, that day, specifically, just pass all the tracks. So I could, with a clear conscience, say I did it, instead of being a Christian 24-7. 24-7 is where it's at. That's in the hard times, the good times. That's when the opportunities present themselves, you're available. In conversation, in track, your life is available. That's the test, is longevity. So as they sing this song, consider your spirituality, consider where you are, and listen to the words and really uh, take it into heart, and that would be good. There are so many Christians. strong besetting sin and they wonder if they'll ever learn the victory to win the only way to victory is not through strong resolve it is myself upon the cross in Jesus Christ and in him I resurrected to a pure and holy life have you died have you signed the warrant for your own execution Jesus, when you came to earth to give your life for me, you faced every strong temptation, but from sin your life was free. And if my perfect Savior had to die a cruel death, to Obtain my freedom, how can I 
Thank you. What a song.